Here's the second vodcast for Unit 2. Uh, this is the first one that I made. Hope you enjoy the first one uh, from the Khan Academy going over uh, the types of light and, or what it light is. I want to quickly touch on some of the things that this unit is specifically going to look at towards the end. Some big questions that normally people have about astronomy or the universe in general are things like, is there a, a beginning? All right, does science support the idea of there was a beginning when all of this stuff uh, was, was created? Or is the universe infinite? All right, has it always been around? Will it always be around? Uh, if, it, if there is a beginning, when was this beginning? And what evidence is there just uh, that we have that there was a beginning? Will the universe ever uh, end? If it had a beginning, that implies that it must have an end. And how's it going to end? Is it going to end in ice? Is it going to blow itself up? Is it going to shrink? Is it going to collapse? Is it going to end in fire? What's going on at the end? And how could we possibly understand this? Um, how big is the universe? All right. Is it uh, infinite in size and mass? Or is there an end to it? What about the shape? If there's a size to it, that means and it's finite. That means it has to have some kind of shape. Is it flat? Is it round? Is it some blobby, weird shape? Um, and then another thing that students always want to talk about are aliens. Are there really aliens? Um, is it possible that there are other intelligent beings out there? And if so, could we ever possibly communicate with them? Could we visit them, call them up, and say hi, and how you doing? Or uh, at least go there someday in, in advanced spaceships? All right. These are all questions that we are going to get to. Uh, to get there, though, we have to understand how astronomers... Uh, get this kind of information. And it started with the Khan Academy's uh, podcast over light. All right. This should look pretty familiar. This is the electromagnetic spectrum going all the way from radio waves with very low energies, with very sh uh, long wavelengths and uh, low frequencies, moving through the microwave and infrared into the visible, the parts that we see. All right. Uh, the 1% of the spectrum that our eyes can detect, up into the ultraviolet X-rays and gamma rays, the highest energies, the shortest wavelengths, and the highest frequencies. <clears throat> now, again, we only see this 1%. Uh, but how do we see that? We see that with our eyes, but the main tool that astronomers use are telescopes. And what is the main purpose of a telescope? I bet most of you are saying right now that the main purpose of a telescope is to see distant objects. That is somewhat true. All right. We do get to see very distant objects with telescopes. But the main purpose is to see faint objects, not necessarily the distant ones. Uh, for example, you can use your eyes at night and see thousands of stars. Some of those stars at the very edge of our Milky Way galaxy. So they're very, 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 very far. But you still can't see the moons around Saturn, uh, asteroids that are in between Mars and Jupiter. Those aren't visible. Telescopes allow you to collect a lot of light to see very faint objects. Now, the more distant an object is, the fainter it is. Uh, so in that aspect, you're kind of right if you think distant objects. Right. Secondly, certain kinds of telescopes allow us to see those other forms of light that we can't see naturally with our eyes. So we're going to look at just telescopes in this. All right. <clears throat> there are two kinds of telescopes, refractors and reflectors. If you have a telescope or a pair of binoculars, you have refractors. All right. A refractor uses lenses to collect all of this light. And when light passes through that primary lens, the objective lens, light will bend or refract, hence the name refractor. And when it bends, it will go through a second lens, where your, is your eyepiece, and it will then focus all of that light that is gathered onto your eye. In essence, what it does is it takes your one centimeter wide uh, retina, the part of your eye that can see light, and blows it up to whatever size this objective lens is here. If you've ever noticed that animals that uh, see very well at night in the dark have very large eyes because they have very large eyes that collect a lot of light. The bigger the telescope, the fainter things that you can see. This is a picture of the world's largest refractor. 
They're Yerkes Observatory in Wisconsin, I believe. And it's about a meter wide. <clears throat> uh, they don't make them uh, this big anymore, uh, at least refractors, just because it's very expensive and time-consuming. Uh, you start off with a big, molten uh, piece of glass, and you allow it to cool for a very long time. Uh, if you let it cool down too fast, it can crack or cause other imp imperfections. And once you get past this one meter size, they actually deform under their own weight. They're so heavy that they'll actually start to pool at the bottom. Reflectors, on the other hand, are what most telescopes, at least the big ones, are made out of today. Reflectors use a primary mirror to gather that light. That light will then reflect off of the mirror to maybe the second mirror where an eyepiece and, and your eye will be. It's a Subaru telescope, uh, one of the largest optical telescopes we have. Uh, it is 8 meters wide, something around 25, 26 feet. Very, very large. Again, the more surface area it has, the larger the lens, uh, or excuse me, the larger the, the mirror, the more light it gathers, the fainter objects can, uh, can see. It takes that light, bounces off a mirror up here, and through the primary mirror to some kind of sensor or maybe an eyepiece back here. Uh, this is a single mirror. It's not the largest uh, telescope we have. In fact, these are the largest telescopes currently in operation. These are the Keck telescopes. They're 10 meters wide each. So that's about 34, 35 feet. Uh, one thing you should definitely notice is they're not round, uh, and it's actually a collection of 32 uh, individual mirrors that all work together to focus that light. Bigger is better in astronomy. More light, the fainter objects we can see. Now, if you notice something about the Keck telescope, it's not on top of a mountain like this. All right. In fact, there are the Keck telescopes right here. And you've got some other ones. Uh, but why in the world would you go through the trouble and the expense of building these telescopes on top of a mountain? In fact, these are extinct volcanoes. This is Mauna uh, Kea in Hawaii. So why build one there? Some students want to say that when building a telescope on top of a mountain, you're that much closer to a planet or a galaxy or whatever you're looking at, therefore it looks bigger. But the problem there is these things are billions or even trillions of miles away. You're, you're raising up just a mile or two up in the atmosphere. That's really not getting that any, uh, much closer. So why then go through the trouble and the expense? The answer is really good atmospheric seeing. Seeing is how astronomers describe the ease at which it is to make good observations. All right? And there are a lot of things that make astronomy here in Indiana bad for us. All right? Close to a town, you've got light pollution. It's usually cloudy here. And there's always air rising up and sinking. Those convection currents in the air. If you see a thunderstorm, you see those clouds rising up. All of that combined to make images that we take here really, really bad. When you get on top of these mountains, right, <clears throat> you have very, very good seeing. And let me explain why. If you've ever been underwater and looked out above the surface to a tree or a person, you're going to notice that they're really distorted. The same thing is happening as light enters into our atmosphere. It hits our atmosphere, gets uh, moved around, and when you're seeing a star twinkle, uh, what you would see if you really zoom in on it is that the star is bouncing around randomly. Well, if you're trying to take a picture of that, it's not good. All right. uh, it's very hard to get a sharp image of something that's really faint if it's getting distorted and moved by our atmosphere. Up above uh, the clouds, away from city lights, and uh, on top of mountain, there is less uh, atmosphere to go through, so it's not as blurry. Another thing that our atmosphere does, not only does it distort light, it actually absorbs some of it. So the visible light makes it through our atmosphere just fine. So does radio waves. The things that shine in other wavelengths, like infrared, x-ray, gamma rays, or UV, uh, those kinds of light really don't make it through our atmosphere. Uh, a little bit of the infrared can be uh, get through or can get through our atmosphere, but things that give off UV, that part of the light and uh, the X-ray and the gamma get absorbed up in our uh, parts of our atmosphere, like the ozone layer. Uh, most of the 
infrared here gets absorbed by the, uh, the water vapor in our atmosphere. So even if you have a really large telescope like the Keck, those would not be able to produce an image of things that give off UV or X-ray or gamma or really infrared uh, for the most part because that light doesn't even get to the surface. And that's where the Hubble Space Telescope comes in. It is only eight feet wide. It's about as long as a school bus, but it's not anywhere near the size of these large telescopes. But it takes some of the best pictures in the world because it's not on this Earth, it's actually above it in space, where the light pollution, the atmospheric turbulence, uh, the clouds, they're all far uh, below it. So the light that comes into its uh, mirror is perfectly sharp. It can zoom in as much as it wants, stares at these objects for as long as it's, it wants, and gets very clear pictures. That's why the Hubble Space Telescope is so uh, revolutionary and so much better than any telescope previous. Now, there are ways with modern technology we can start to get around those uh, roadblocks, which we'll talk about tomorrow in class. <clears throat> but uh, that's going to do it for this podcast. Make sure you get on Edmodo uh, with your notes from this podcast and you take the short quiz so that you can get some points from this. And I will see you tomorrow in class.